is both your operation, your uh, physical facilities, and the people that work for you and with you. Um, it's not something that can be taken lightly. Anything that comes out one way or another, if it is tied back to your club, to your company, to your organization, you want to make sure that it comes back with a positive reaction. So there's a lot of hard work involved with that. And the main thing you have to remember is it doesn't just come off the top of your head. You have to plan, you have to prepare, and you have to follow through. When the reporter or the councilman or the mayor asks you a question, you should know exactly what it is you're going to say, and you should practice beforehand as to how you're going to react to those questions. The first step overall, though, is you want to sit down and create the message. The basics of what you're going to build each and every piece of your media relations um, campaign around. You know, for people that are involved with the NRA, it's something along the lines of what I've listed there, the finest shooting facility in Alexandria, Virginia. Fun for the whole family, providing the best in shooting sports. It doesn't have to be specific, but it should be something that reflects exactly what it is that you're doing, what you're trying to provide, or the area in which you're serving. Um, from that, you can drill down into the specifics and worry about how you're going to capture those different little nuances. And once you get that message, what it is that you're trying to get out, it should be reflected in everything and anything that you're doing in your logos, the advertisements, the articles you write, the websites you have, and the newsletters that you send out. If you've written a piece that's going in your newsletter, or there's a post that's going up on your blog, or an article that's going to appear in a local newspaper, what does that do for you? Is this putting forth our message in some way, shape, or form? If not, then what's the point in writing it? So sit down, make sure that you know exactly what it is that you're trying to articulate and that that message comes through with these different pieces that you're putting forth. Now the different forms of communications is basically everything that you say, write, or do. It's everything that revolves around the organization, everything that comes out one way or another. So with that, you have to think of how you can approach it. And there's just dozens and dozens of different ways I've listed there, you know, crisis management, newsletters, television websites, community relations, op-eds, and there's all sorts of different ways that you are going to have a chance to communicate your message. I'm going to go over the first one that I listed there, crisis management. Now, Back in the day, before I started working at the NRA, which was five years ago now, um, I spent some time working for a crisis management organization. And that's basically when something happened that somebody didn't like or that reflected poorly upon your business. And the next thing you knew, they came to us. And we would show them how to sit down and act in front of the cameras with the public and with the community. And the main thing that you have to remember is with those people, something already went wrong. You need to act before something goes wrong. And once you have an understanding of those potential pitfalls or the problems that you're going to have, then you sit there and you think, well, what are we going to say if we're asked this or if we're asked that? So get the questions down. Come up with the responses and then have one person, and it should be one person only, whether it's your communications manager, director of advertising, or your CEO, but have just one person speak to the press. Why just the one person? Because if you have more than one person, then there are going to be two different messages out there. They're going to deviate just ever so slightly one way or another. And once you start deviating, then they'll start looking for ways that they can pick apart at your response. So have your one person, have your response, and most importantly, stay on message. 
no matter where they're trying to steer you or where you're trying to go, make sure that you're communicating what it is that you want to say about this specific event. And on newsletters, if you've got a club out there, if you've got a business out there, maybe you've just got a regular community group or a shooting club or whatever it might be, newsletters are always a great way to communicate with your employees, with your members, or with the community in general. And there are some specific things that you should have in each and every one of these newsletters. You know, there's going to be the review of events. You know, what's going on at the club and what's coming on in the future. A message from the president or the CEO or from the coach, you know, depending on who you're writing the newsletter for. And you look at some of the things that are going to happen and what they, what we've accomplished and what we're looking forward to. Those basic messages. You should also have a calendar of what's in store for the next month because if I get the newsletter in February and I say, oh, look at that. That looks like fun. I wish I would have known about that. And they don't know what's going to come on down the line. Well, the calendar takes care of that. Once you get the newsletter, it should be available both online and in paper form. Now, when it comes to the paper form, publishing is slowly in the way of phasing out. You see it happening all over the country. Uh, the big operations, uh, the, the one I always like to mention is the Christian Science Monitor, no longer publishes a paper. It's all online. And when you look at the statistics overall, with most people looking for that younger dollar, the 18 to 35 year old, they're not reading newspapers anymore. They're seeing it online. They're going to the web. So if your newsletter is available online, you have a better opportunity to reach those people, convert them into customers, into members, into supporters. And a final thing that you should think about having for your newsletter is a few items from your store. If you're a club, I'm sure you've got hats, you've got shirts, you've got bumper stickers. If you're an actual operation, maybe there's a few sales you want to highlight. Something in there that just gives them the opportunity to purchase something. And the press release. The press release is basically a way that you're pleased to announce. It's a standard thing of reaching out to the press to let them know we have this event or this sale or we have this person coming to our store. Now the basic way of starting everything out is we are pleased to, you know, for us it's the National Rifle Association is pleased to announce that. And what are we announcing? Well, in that first sentence or the second sentence, you want to answer those four questions, the who, what, where, why, and when. And once you have that from there, then you want to get into something that they can use to create their article around. So you've answered the basic questions and then you need to give them a quote because a story without a quote is a hard story to sell to an editor. So get the quote from the coach, from the CEO, from the president, whoever in your club or your business or your group is there that comes off as uh, an official a source for that particular subject matter. Give them a little bit more overall and make sure that there is contact information there for the people down the line. From that, there's also the chance that you might want to talk about the non-traditional formats of uh, press releases. The non-traditional formats are more of the basic articles that are written for the reporters and the forms of press releases. Instead of the standard starting off with, uh, we are pleased to announce that, you would start it off with something, there was something special today at the National Rifle Association as, and you go on from there. Think of it as something that you're actually going to read. Um, recently there has been a change where those seem to be the preferred types of press releases that people are sending out and uh, they tend to pick up a little bit more speed and traction than the others. That doesn't mean that the standard side should be phased out. It's just another way that you can go about approaching it. The op-eds or the articles. Now, what's the difference between an op-ed or an article? Well, the op-ed takes a stand. It has a point of view. You're 
advocating for something. You're trying to say that we should do this or we should do that, where the articles are a review of an event or insight into an individual. So if you're saying that we need to get that water main fixed on Main Street, then that's an op-ed. If you're writing, they were fixing the water main on Main Street, then that's an article. And as you're going through and you're meeting these different people in the media, there's a chance that you will have the opportunity to talk with the editors, to talk with the assignment editors, to talk with some of the reporters and say, hey, I could do this for you. And speaking as somebody that's worked on both sides of the fence, when you have a good deal of the content taken care of or written for you in completely, it is a relief. So don't be afraid to approach and offer your services on that front. Now, while writing such a thing can be a bit of a pain, and it does take some time and it does take some effort, what it does for you is it establishes you as an expert in that particular field. And as an expert in the field, that gives you more influence both in the media and in the community. And it helps build up your uh, contacts overall as well. And hopefully, if it's a well-written article and you make a good point, then it will help recruit new members. But again, as you're doing all of these things, you want to make sure that that basic message that we talked about on the first slide, that basic message comes back and is reflected in some way or form in that piece. Now, getting on the radio is also a nice way to get the message across. I'll tell you from back in the day when I was working as a producer for NRA News, there were a lot of days that we were scrambling up until the time we went on air that you wanted to find some sort of guest to fill up a particular spot. So making yourself available for a radio interview, it is a wealth of uh, information that you can give to the community and also provide a service for the radio station. And with that, that also makes you an asset, somebody that they can look to and they say, well, what about Bob? We can go back and talk to him. He was great. So when you're on the radio, there are a few basic points that you want to make sure to do. One thing is to smile. I know you're sitting there thinking, why do I worry about smiling while I'm on the radio? Nobody's going to see it. Well, there is a different cadence to your voice when you smile. I know it sounds silly, but there is. It comes across as cheery, as happy, and if you just sit there with a the regular face and the stone face, it's just going to be, oh, 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 and it's not going to come across as anything fun. And why do you want somebody back on the air who isn't fun? So when you get on there, make sure you're smiling. Also, you want to make notes and take notes. You're not on camera, so it's not going to be that distracting to the viewer when you're sitting there writing something down or if you have to read something straight off of a piece of paper might not seem professional, but there's a lot of information that can be shared or a lot of points that you want to get across and you want to have it right there in front of you. And that'll help you get back to your core message. Because believe me, once they say you're live now on WKRP, then it comes back and there can be a bit of stage fright that comes forward. So don't worry about taking notes and making notes of there. And when the interview begins, you want to make sure to thank the host. Thank you very much for having us today. I'm really looking forward to it. And also ending with the thanks. It's been great fun. I'd love to come back anytime. And finally, make sure that you have some sort of a closing message. Something that gives about 5 to 10 to 15 seconds worth of wrap-up that has your basic message in there. And that's another part of saying, well, maybe you need to make notes. So have something written down right there in front of you that you can wrap it up. There's a little piece that I wrote down there. There's fun for the whole family at the Alexandria Gun Club, located at the corner of Telegraph Road and Hayfield Drive. We're open from 9 to 5 on weekends, weekdays 6 to 10 on weekends. An indoor range and an outdoor range for pistols, rifles, and shotguns. First-time shooters or grizzled veterans, we've got a spot for you. It's a nice little thing that says everything that somebody would want to hear. There's something in there for somebody, the date, the time, the place, 
and the fact that it's going to be fun. And when you're on the radio, you want to make sure you're having fun. On television, now if you're lucky enough to score yourself a TV interview, you want to make sure that you're dressed for the part. And you don't have to be all buttoned up, but uh, for some people, the idea of dressing up beyond a business casual thing, which is what we're basically talking about here, is not the way that they go to work every day. Now, you, a lot of people, you might show up with a hat or a t-shirt or something like that. You don't, you don't want to do that while you're on camera because, again, you're trying to get your point across. And if you've got the hat that isn't quite right or the shirt that isn't quite right, that's going to take away from your overall message. If you have something that is general, that is just that looks like a regular average ordinary person, then you're not going to take away from what it is you're trying to say. Um, and before you go in and sit down with, with the interviewer, you want to make sure that you understand the parameters. Again, this goes back to what we were talking about before with crisis management. You want to understand what they're asking about, how long it's going to be, and if it is something that uh, you're ready to talk about. But once you get the information, you can again sit down and prepare your responses. And that's a very important thing because as you're there, I said there might be a little bit of stage fright when it comes to radio. There are going to be a whole lot of straight stage fright when those television cameras go on. So make sure that you're prepared. And another question to ask them is, is this edited or is it straight through? Is it live? You know, if it's a live shot, then you're going to know anything and everything that's going to happen. If they're going to edit the piece, then you have to sit there and ask yourself, well, are they actually going to give my response to the question that was asked, or are they just going to give my response? And what are they going to lead into with the response? If it's a straight through shot, if it's a live shot, then what you say more than likely is going to get across in the correct context. If it's edited, well, then you want to make sure that you're really prepared for it, because then they could drop it in just about anywhere. So make sure you know what type of um, editing or production is going to go into it. It's in a practice with friends or family playing Mike Wallace. Uh, I understand that I, I need to change that. I'm only 45 years old, but I, I heard from a few people that the, they didn't know who Mike Wallace was. Well, for those of you who don't know who Mike M Wallace was, he was the lead anchor for 60 Minutes. And boy, if Mike Wallace showed up at your front door, you were scared. <laughs> it was not a good thing to see. So what, what I mean when I say we practice with friends and family playing Mike Wallace, you want them to come at you with the hardball questions. Ask me something that I'm not prepared for. Ask me a few softballs and then hit me right between the eyes with something. Because you've got to be prepared for that too. Everything can all be smiles and roses up until the point where the camera goes on and they start hitting you with the questions. Now, if it does get to that point and you are worried about that, don't worry about actually answering the question that was asked. You think about those Sunday morning political talk shows where candidate or the governor or the whoever is just sitting there and he's saying the same thing over and over and over again, and you're thinking, they're not answering the questions. Well, of course they're not answering the questions because they're questions that they don't want to answer. They're not necessarily there to answer the questions. They're there to get a certain message across. And you need to think about doing that too. So if the questions are off topic or unfair, give them a little bit of well, that's not what we're really here for today. We're here to talk about the brand new grand opening of Bob's and go on from there. The community relations. When people think about when it comes to media relations that everything has to be in some sort of printed or digital or video form. Well, it's not just that. It's also how you're acting and interacting with your community because they're also going to take the presence that you're putting forward and, um, 
and wondering if that is something that's uh, going to benefit them overall in the community. So with that, the community relations side, there are different people that you want to get involved with. Uh, the Chamber of Commerce is always a great way to go through and meet other decision makers. team or a hockey team or a soccer team or something like that is always a great way to go. Uh, the first one that I have mentioned there is Chico's Bail Bonds. And that goes back to the old Bad News Bears movie where they didn't have sponsorship for the team and it ended up being Chico's Bail Bonds. And that was a great, funny little bit. But it's something that stuck with me to this day. And where I had to live in that area and I needed bail, well, then I think I'd probably think of Chico's first. So it's a small thing, but if you sponsor somebody's kid, you pay for the uniforms or for their equipment or something like that, they're going to remember that. And then when you need to get out there in front of the public or you need to sway a decision, they're going to think, oh, I remember them. They sponsored my kid's t-ball team. And that's going to help. Um, County fairs, you know, get a booth at a county fair, work the donkey tank, sell funnel cakes or hot dogs. You know, something there that's going to show that you are part of the community. Because with a lot of the clubs and associations that we have, there tend to be some battles back and forth when it comes to zoning and sound. And they don't know who you are. And if you are part of these local events, of the county fairs and the fundraisers and the parades, then they get to know who you are. And it's not something that they're gonna, that's going to come across as, well, they're just those people that go up there and shoot at the club. You know, we don't know who they are. They're a bunch of strangers. And, well, no, now that you're part of that, you're going to be interacting with them. And that's going to help the overall image of the operation. You also need to think about having events at your store, at your club, at the range, or wherever it is. And what kind of events can you hold? Well, I threw three of them up there. You know, you meet the owner, or we've got this new service, or there's a celebrity coming in town. Something that's, of course, germane to your operation. You know, having uh, Gabby Franco, she's great to have. She's a lot of fun. But having her at your new deli isn't really going to bring as much uh, oomph to that as if you have somebody like Rachel Ray. Or, I know these are big time names, but they are people that can come into town or can stop by or you have a book signing or something like that. Have those events there and that will bring in the media and that will bring in the community. And the way that you're going to make sure that you, it's going to bring in the media and the community is that you're going to invite them. You're going to make sure that your top customers or members are going to be there because they're going to be there, one, they're going to be excited about this event, and two, you know that they're going to be supportive of your efforts. Again, you bring the community leaders in because they're the ones that are going to be making decisions down the road. And if you give them a good show, a good time, pass out you know, the, the hot dogs and the soda and the whatever else you're going to have there, it's going to be fun for everyone. And plan it out, too. You want to make sure that you know exactly what is going to happen with this event from the moment it opens to the moment it closes. Uh, you should have a timetable in place. Now, that doesn't mean if everybody's having a good grand old time that you need to kick them out just because it's 6 o'clock and that's when you said it was going to end. But it is something you have to try to keep it to a certain timetable, one for you, two for your people, and three because oh, I plan to go to this event over at Bob's Range and uh, I'm going to be done by 6 o'clock so I can plan to be back with the family by 7 or I can go have a lane bowling there at 7 o'clock or I've done something that I have my own timetable so don't let it get too out of hand but don't push it on, push people out the door just because you think it's time. Speaking engagements. There's always an opportunity to talk to somebody there in the public. There's going to be the garden club, or maybe it's the new computer club, or 
like we were saying before with the youth teams, there's going to be some opportunity for you to get up and talk about something. It doesn't necessarily have to be about your business, but if it is, then it helps establish yourself as an expert in that particular field. But if it's a community issue, something that's going on, then you get to go out there and meet, again, this new group of people. And once you get up there, make your speech, put forth a positive image, and get that message of yours across, then there's a good chance that the word of mouth, or the word of your message will spread by word of mouth through social media. And if there happens to be a reporter there, somebody that's covering the event, pops up on the newspaper, they talk about it on the radio, maybe there's a quick mention on television uh, news. You never know where it's going to go out. Worst case scenario, you're going to meet new people. You meet new people, you make a good impression. You make a good impression, and then down the road, when you need their help, they'll be more likely to help. Hey, Lars, um, a question came in. Um, are there any platforms or websites or media sites that are gun-friendly where they can promote these, these events or whatever they have? Um, the ones that you suggested, all the, the community events? Or should they well, contact um, the, the newspaper or should they just go online to like a forum? If, if we're talking to most of the operations or the, the local clubs, there are going to be, you know, specific to your area, to your, your city, to your region, to your state. Uh, there will be message boards, there will be local forums, and that's a way to start getting the word out. Um, for the getting in touch with uh, the local reporters, you'd be amazed at how often they're likely to accept what it is that you're giving them and to do a little promotion. Because like I said, there are times when I'm trying to write an article or we're trying to produce a radio show and we don't have content. And that timetable is coming up. So if you call up and say, hey, we have this thing, you should come and cover it, they're more than likely to come up and uh, do that for you. So look at the local newspapers, uh, check online, see who's covering similar type events, shoot them a note, find out who the assignment editor is for that newspaper, radio station, or, a, or TV show, and send them a note too. Just three or four sentences, hey, I saw that you covered this the other day, we're having a similar event here, you should come on down and see for yourself. Now, should they only contact gun-friendly uh, sites or pro-gun sites, or does it not matter? Well, if contacting those that come off as uh, the pro-gun is definitely going to be an easier sale. Uh, when you're talking to those where you know, most of the reporters are supposed to maintain objectivity is uh, the key word. Uh, sometimes that happens, sometimes that doesn't. But if you're already in the gun arena and people know you and people like you, then you're only going to reach that part. When I'm talking about the media relations, I'm talking about the entire area of where you're operating. So you have to reach outside. Now, that doesn't mean that you want to go and contact somebody that's always slamming your range or guns or something like that. You definitely don't want to have them down there. But if it's someone up there who doesn't seem that they have uh, an opinion or a view one way or the other, or they at least seem open to the idea, then you need to embrace that. And uh, one of the ways that you can go through and embrace that is through meeting the media. Um, because uh, if you know what they need or what they're expecting, um, then it's easier for you to put together a message, a press release, an overall pitch for them to come down. And uh, one way that you can go through doing that is uh, by taking a look at their editorial calendars. Um, like the magazines that we have here, they are publishing, they're actually writing and publishing and putting everything forward today. The, what they write now, that's going to appear in April. So it's not like Sports Illustrated where you're going to see the coverage of the Super Bowl the day after the Super Bowl. It gets done three, four months in advance a lot of times. 
Uh, for newspapers, it's not quite as true. And of course, the newspapers, that is the daily news, but they will all have an editorial calendar, things that we want to cover, ideas that we're going to focus on in this month. Um, if, you, if they aren't readily apparent there on the website or through the magazines and the newspapers, take a look at the advertising section. Because a lot of advertisers are going to say, well, you know, if, it's, if they're going to be covering camping in June, well, then I want to put in my ads for June um, so they're going to come by my camping store. Well, if you know that they're going to come be covering camping in June, then you can tell the reporters or the assignment editors, which I tell you there, those are the key guys that you want to be friends with. You can tell them, hey, in June we're doing this, and it's related to the camping pitch that you guys are doing. So that's one way that you can find out exactly what the editorial calendars are if they're not looking to share. As I said before, providing content makes their job easier. And if you make their job easier, then they're more likely to come back and ask you for seconds. Um, when you go to meet the media, you can call ahead, talk to somebody there in the newsroom, you know, try to talk to the assignment editors, uh, the overall editors that cover your general area, or maybe even a reporter or two, and talk about coming in and sitting down and saying, this is what we're looking to do. We're having this event. We'd like you to come cover it. And while you go there to do it, have a little swag for them, a little something to give away. The hat, the t-shirt, the water bottles. You know, they're reporters. I mean, maybe you've got a special pen or a special notebook or something that they're going to like. Think about handing that, those out, too, as you go. So a little bit of swag can go a long way. And as you're getting your message together, you have to remember that you're not selling to one person. They come, the customers, the members, they come in all shapes and forms. So you have to alter your response. What you're telling to the, to the soccer mom is not the same thing as that you're telling to your kid that's in college or your grandparents or the single parent that's scraping to get by. Each of these people need a different message. So as you're trying to figure out what your demographics are and who you're trying to reach, you have to focus in on those specific areas. So what you're putting together and putting in a flyer that you're going to have at the local toy store is something different than what you're going to put together and having a flyer that's going to appear at the local pool hall. Different people, different messages. Still have your core message in place, but remember that the approach is going to be a little different with each one. Also, you want to make sure that you're not limiting whatever it is you do. Uh, we're going to get into the social media in a little bit, but you have to understand that usually when there's a message out there, it's coming to you in print, it's coming to you over the radio, it's coming on TV or YouTube. There's all sorts of different forms. And um, building trend right now a lot of people are doing is that they're looking to see it, hear it, and read it. So what that means is we're going to shoot a video, and we're going to put that video up on YouTube, and there are going to be a lot of people that are going to watch that. They're going to take the audio from that video, and we're going to make it a podcast, put it up through iTunes, have it available on our website, something like that. And then we're going to get the transcript from that video, and we're going to write that up, and we're going to post it on our company website so then people can read it. So there's three different forms of communications that you have by doing one simple thing that's going to expand your overall reach. So as you're thinking about how it is that you're going to go out and promote yourself, don't limit your potential outreach. Um, and one of the big things that you definitely have to do is be online. It's the first place that somebody's always going to look. Whenever anybody calls me on from so-and-so, the first thing I'm doing is I'm Googling them. You're going to want to have a website. You're going to want to have a social media presence. And if you say, well, we can't really afford to have a website or do social media, the truth is you can't afford not to. Because overall, with your outreach through the website and the social media, that's going to bring more money in than it costs to put those different things up. 
Now with social media, if you're going to do one thing, one thing at all, you have to be on Facebook. You update it every two or three days at least. People are going to talk to you back and forth. Make sure you're respond, going to respond. With Twitter, you have to respond to that on a daily basis. Almost the same thing with Google+. YouTube, we talked about that's where we're going to put up those videos so people can see some of the fun that we're having at the store, at the club, or with the people that work there. Uh, Pinterest and Tumblr, those are different places that you get to share photos. And uh, you can write up a little bit when you post those photos. But again, it's getting across the message, this basic message that you wanted to have back in the beginning when we talked about. So have the clear message reflected in all of these different things that you do. People say that we can't afford to do the social media, and the truth is you can't afford not to. Your company website. As I said, the first thing I do is I Google somebody. You've got to make sure you have a website. And there are basic requirements and pages that you have to have. The welcome, the contact, the about us, the news, the calendar, and your little copyright. The copyright's a little thing at the bottom. It's copyright 2014. I can't tell you how many times I go to a website and I say copyright 2008. Well, that makes me think that you haven't updated your website in four, five, six years now. It's something that gets you dismissed out of hand. So make sure that you get that copyright changed at the beginning of every year. And most importantly, don't go cheap. A bad website, I know some people are saying, well, at least it's something. No, a bad website is just a bad website. It's not going to go good for you with that any way at all. So what are the, some of the things that you want to do? This is what you do want to do. You want to have a masthead at the top. A masthead is what you have at the top of every newspaper. It's the big old brand that's going to be reflecting your image, your message, wherever you go. So you want to have a, a picture and then maybe the, the uh, name of the business or the club, and it's going to be bright, it's going to be airy, it's going to be something that puts forth a positive invention. You want to make sure that you have one font for body text, probably the same one for hyperlink and maybe something a little bit smaller for captions around photos. I listed there the, the popular ones that most people use. Uh, that's basically uh, the Ariel, the Verdana, the Heflitic. Those are the basics that everybody goes with, and that's what's familiar and easy to read. If you have the big crazy fonts, then people are going to get sick of trying to read that. And then they say pick a layout and stay with it. If you're going to have the masthead on top, the links underneath that, and then the content underneath those links, then, then that's the way you want to keep it. You don't want to change the links to the left side on another page. You don't want to have the text over on the left side and the links on the right on another. Same layout, same colors all throughout the site. What you don't want to do, the center justified text. What have you read? What have you picked up outside of a wedding invitation that has centered justified text? Nothing. Multiple layers and multiple colors. As I told you before, you don't want to change around the layouts that you have. One layout per website and the colors. People will change the colors of the banners, of the background, of the font. That doesn't do anything for you but look like you're going a little nuts. So stick with the layout, stick with your colors. A lack of contact or local information. I go to a website and it looks interesting. I want to know information. I don't have a place to call or I don't have a place that I can drive to. I went to an event uh, two years ago out in Illinois. I went to the website to find out exactly where I was driving. They had longitude and latitude listed. You know, longitude is, latitude is great if I can put that into my GPS, but I'm working off my iPhone here and I'm looking to throw in an address. So have your address listed. Um, PDFs are made so I can print something up and mail it into you. Well, if I'm not mailing something into you, then don't put it up in a PDF. Forms are, well, forms we, we get to a little bit later, or an under construction page. Under construction, if you're under construction and you don't have a page, don't put it up. Have your page done before you put it up. And watch the fold. What's the fold that I'm talking about? You know how you scroll up and down on a web page? Anything you have to scroll down to, that's under the fold. It's a term from the newspaper business. When the paper's folded, what's under the fold? If it's above the fold, that's the most important stuff. So think about it. I want to have my most important stuff 
in view before I have to scroll. And don't have any animations or ads or, well, not any. The animation, kill the animation. You know, the dancing baby died a long time ago. I'm still seeing some of that pop up here and there. Ads. People have ads. That's going to happen. Don't worry about that. Just make sure that they're in the right category and they're not big and they're not obnoxious. Sounds. Uh, there was a range out in the, the northwest. Love their website. But every time I clicked on a link, there was a ricochet sound. That's all good and great, but boy, it got annoying after the third or fourth page. And here are some of the examples that I talk about. Everything is sun or justified. And that's just going a little bit crazy. There's different fonts. There's different colors. And I, I don't want to look at it. You, you go through a couple of different pages and you just want to run away. Another one here, there's just so much information. The mass, the thing in the, in the middle, it doesn't really say much. It looks like it was drawn by hand. The links over on the left side, you know, that's, that's what we did when we first started building websites, but today you'd be hard-pressed to find anybody that doesn't have the links all across the top. There's different colors. There's different fonts. And this is the home page. The home page is where you tell people, this is who I am. So what you are is a range schedule or an event? No, no, no. You save that for the range schedule page. Don't think that you have to put everything on the home page. You put everything on the home page, you look like you don't really know what you're doing. If you need a page for events, for schedules, for news, put that there on that page, on the schedules, on the event, or on the news page. Here's a nice looking site. It's attractive, it's organic, it gives you the basic information overall, the places that you can link. You can see, oh, well, that's you can, on the left side there. I'm going to go shoot, and I'll look at those facilities. Don't they look nice? And this one for the Joshua Creek Ranch, you know, beautiful picture. It looks like a place that I'd love to go out and hunt. You know, you're going to get those type of birds there. It's open. It's airy. It's beautiful. It's a fantastic place. So those are the different things, whether you go to something like this, you're going to go to this Rifle and Pistol Club, or you're going to go to this Rifle and Pistol Club to go shoot. Big difference. Now the last thing that we talk about over, whoop, overall is the fact of whether or not I'm going to be able to afford the outreach. And excuse me as I flip through my, uh, my do's and don'ts and examples again to get to the final page. When it gets to the outreach, you have to think about what it actually costs. So if it costs, as I've thrown here, $150, or say the annual membership costs $10, and the average member or customer spends $140 a year, that means that the average cost per member is $150. So if your membership is $200 and they buy $200 worth of stuff that year, then that means for every customer you're going to be bringing in $400. But we'll stick with $150. So it's $150 is what you're going to bring in with every new customer or member. And with whatever outreach you do, building a website, printing up flyers, taking an ad on an Internet site or putting it in a newspaper, it's going to generate 10 new customers. That means that that's going to bring in an additional 1,500 members to your club or store. So if you spend $1,000 for something that's going to bring in 10 new members, and that's going to bring in uh, $1,500 more, that means that what you did just made 500 bucks for the club. So you might not have it all in your treasury right now. It might not be in the coffers or the bank account. But if you spend that money, you're going to bring in money well over that. Maybe that's going to make more sense for you on newspaper ads, on radio ads, on building the website. But one way or another, it is going to make more sense for you. So when you say talk about the fact that we can't afford to build a website, the fact that you're turning away customers by not doing it is how you say that, oh, we can't afford it. I see I got a question that coming in. How do we handle a debate type media format where you're 
uh, with your opposition. Well, again, before you agree to appear in a debate type media format, you have to figure out who's going to be monitoring that, who's going to be the competition. Once you find out who the competition is, then you're probably going to be able to do research and figure out exactly uh, what it is that they're going to focus on so then you can understand how to focus your debate, what your rebuttal is going to be. So that's basically what you would do to prepare overall. As you're on stage, as you're doing the debate, you have to keep calm, you have to maintain composure, and you have to make sure that you give them an intelligent response to each and every question. It's nice and it's fun to give them a quick little backhanded uh, comment, uh, to drop a little bomb on them and to make them look silly, but if you do that, there's a chance that you're going to come off as the bad guy. And while your friends might laugh, there are the people that live in the community or the decision leaders or the reporters that are there watching this happen. They're going to say, well, this guy was just being a smart ass. He wasn't really there to debate, and he made this offensive comment to the, his opposition. So that's how you want to handle a debate-type media format. And with that, Son, do we have any other questions? Uh, we'll open this up for another 10 minutes or so for, for questions. If anyone has any specific questions they want answered, uh, this concludes. Lawrence, is that done at the end of your presentation? Yeah, that's a, basically the different aspects that you can look at when you're trying to develop a media relations plan for your club, your business, your operation, your team, whatever it might be. Have the message that you want to get across, figure out how you're going to do that. You know, are you, make sure that you go through and talk about the newsletters and participate in the community events. Start talking to the media there and get your outreach. And as I said, most importantly, make sure you have a website. It's the first thing every reporter is going to look at. It's probably the first thing every town councilman or state representative or something like that is going to look at too. Make sure it's there, make sure it looks good, and make sure that you spend the money for it because that is going to make a huge difference in your overall outlook and operation with the community. Okay, thanks, Lars. Yeah, we'll stick around for a few extra minutes if anyone has any, any questions that they want answered. Uh, part two of Lars' presentation on social media uh, will be presented in March, so please go to our website clubs.nra.org to register for part two of this. And Lars has a lot to say uh, on social media and a little bit uh, if, to follow up on, on what he said today on media relations. So if anyone has any questions, feel free to ask them right now while I'll, for, for Lars or myself. Oh, I see one that came across by way of uh, where can we go and get a website built. Uh, well, getting a website built, if you don't have someone there in the club that has a kid or a cousin or somebody that actually does build websites, there are uh, a number of websites out there that you can go to. I'm told that I should not actually give out a specific one here or there, so Google out and said, starting a website, building a website, Google that. There will be a lot of services out there. They will show you the general layout and they will give you the general cost. Uh, you know, that will change a little bit here and there as you want to fine tune and customize it. But just because you don't know how to build a website doesn't mean that you can't get it done quickly, efficiently, and at a reasonable cost. Okay, I see that we're getting a lot of the same question. Uh, people were asking, will this presentation be available to replay or hear again? Yes, it will be. If you go to the clubs and associations website, clubs.nra.org, we will link this presentation onto our website in a few days. Uh, please give us a few days so we can format it and post it on our website. The direct link, if you have a pen, is clubs.nra.org slash past hyphen webinar.aspx. Don't worry if, if that web link is too long. Just go to the clubs and associations homepage, clubs.nra.org, and you'll find the link 
uh, to it right there that takes you to all the future and past webinars. Lars, we have a question. What is Google Plus? Google Plus. Google Plus is Google's attempt to out Facebook Facebook. Um, it's, I said, think of Facebook, but it's been done through Google. Um, they, you post pictures, you post videos, you post statements, and instead of friends, you have people in your circles. Uh, some of the nice features for Google Plus is I think that they're, uh, the way that they collect and show off your pictures are a little bit better. Uh, the videos are a little bit easier to get through. Uh, they also have this great thing called Google Hangouts. And think of uh, everybody out there familiar with Skype, which is basically a video chat chatting software. So instead of just hearing my voice, you would actually see me as well. Well, if we did this through a Google Hangout, then we would all have video of everybody. So you would see me talking, and then when Sun talks, you would see his face pop up, and everyone else that's participating in the webinar, you could turn on your work web camera too. So if you had a question, you could just sort of pop up and ask it. So the Google Hangouts are actually a very cool feature there. Um, the thing that you also have to remember about Google Plus is that it is run by Google. So Google uses what goes up in Google Plus as part of their overall search algorithm for how they rank things on their search engines. So if you want your web page to go up a little higher on the search engines, if it's not coming up on the first or second page, then you go through and uh, put some posts up there in Google Plus, and that'll help raise your overall image. How can we get search quickly on Bing or Google Search? How can we get search quickly on uh, Bing or Google Search? Well, that gets into uh, search engine optimization. There's a lot of things that you need to do for that. Um, overall, make sure that your title reflects the name of your business and what you do, maybe even where you're located. So for me, you know, one of the things that I do here at the NRA is I run NRA blog. So the title will be NRA blog, covering the operations of the National Rifle Association. Um, then you get a little bit further down. There's it gets very, very technical overall, but there are headers that you have. There's the text that you have. The text that you have hyperlinked. Um, the language that you have in the description. All of these different things adds to the overall value of your web page on Bing and Google. So you want to make sure, I mean, Google a quick art, a few articles on SEO. That's S as in Sam. E is an Edward, O is an Oscar. Uh, do a couple little quick searches on that. There'll be tons of discussions about what you can do and how you can alter your website so you're going to rise in the ranks in either Google or Bing. Now, Lars, this question came in. Uh, me and you can uh, probably answer this as best we can, but the question is what suggestions do you have to work with schools in New York State? Now, um, I would suggest Assume that going back to your earlier mentions about getting good in with the community, and that's how schools would recognize you, and uh, that's how you can start working with them, correct? Right. If you, if you want to start working with schools and have more interaction with them, a uh, great way overall is they're going to have all sorts of fundraisers for band, for uh, maybe a team's going to the state championship or a regional championship and they need some, uh, some cash to pay for the travel or the hotel or something like that. Um, th there's always some sort of fundraisers at the local schools, so a good way to get involved there is to start getting involved with that, whether you're actually offering money or you're offering manpower. And that'll get you in there with the different people in the schools that make the decisions, and as you're interacting with them, you can say, oh, by the way, I do this. We would like to be more involved with what it is you're doing here. Yeah, and I guess it also, um, whatever you're trying to accomplish also, if you're trying to get more members uh, into, your, into your club, you're trying to get more youth and junior members into your club, um, you know, offer up discounts on, on range time. If, if, the school, if a certain school has a, already a junior rifle team, 
allow them to use your facility at a discount or sponsor them uh, that way that they know that you're friendly and, and you want to work with the school. Um, I have a friend who owns a martial arts school and he wants to get more kids to his martial arts schools and in return he has made donations to that school and in return the school allows him to show up at assemblies and do martial arts demonstrations and that's how they're getting the word out so if you guys you know work with the fundraisers or, or have some kind of demonstration free demonstrations or let kids try out your facilities that's a great way to get great PR and let them know that you're around so you, they can come to your club and that actually accomplishes two goals because you can get the interaction with the kid, or three goals, interaction with uh, the kids, what, it, what your target audience is. You're going to be uh, reaching out to the decision makers there at the school and start having some influence there. And if you get this school to agree, then you have the media come and cover whatever it is that you're doing there, whether it's a check presentation or the fact that you're working at this event, that they're calling on leaders from the community to come work this event. And then that's going to come across uh, as positive for you there, too. Say, so if a certain TV news anchor is known to you to have a negative attitude towards guns, should you agree to the interview with them? Not necessarily. Um, there's an old adage of uh, any news is good news. Uh, even if you're getting slammed, well, at least your name's getting out there. That's that's not necessarily uh, true, um, because sometimes when it comes to uh, the people in television or even in print, if they want to get you, they can go through and edit away and really get you good. Um, I would the the question would be of uh, what it is that you're actually talking about. Uh, if we're talking about new zoning for a range. Um, then yes, you should be able to go in and intelligently discuss uh, what it is that we're doing and why it is that you should support the new zoning that we're shooting for. Uh, if it is something on the policy or the political side, then it gets a little bit more dicey. Uh, even, you know, I've been working here at the NRA for five years. I don't touch the political side because that's not what I do. We have people that do that and uh, they live and breathe it. And that is their expertise. It's just the same as, you know, I'm not going to have my, my dentist, you know, give me a heart surgery. So uh, you, you want to make sure that you stick to your own area of expertise. Um, so if it is something that you think you can add uh, an intelligent discussion to, then feel free. But if it gets into some of the higher end stuff, then I, I would shy away from it. So. Okay, thanks Lars. And that is all the time that we have for today. I'd like to thank everyone for participate, participating in our webinar. Be sure to check back for future webinars and to listen to this recording again. Our website is clubs.nra.org. C-L-U-B-S dot N-R-A dot O-R-G. Thank you everyone. Thanks Lars. Thanks Son. Bye.